What's going on, everybody? Happy Saturday. Welcome into an all-new episode of the Pack-A-Day Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. We are inching closer and closer to the 2024 NFL Draft. It should be epic. I am really excited to see what happens in the draft overall. I think this is one of the most unpredictable drafts. I think it's one of the most exciting drafts. And I think not only like NFL unpredictable of what's going to happen, but I think very Packers unpredictable as well. They have, I think, the fourth most draft capital of any team, five top 100 picks. It should be a ton of fun. And speaking of that NFL draft, I'll be hosting a live show Thursday night, the entirety of round one. Yours truly will do Q&A, anything you guys want to talk about. So make sure to stop by for that. Friday, I will be having a special co-host, the one and only Maggie Loney. And I'll also be having three special guests that'll be joining us throughout the course of the night. Uh, Jacob Morley, who is the expert from the Green Bay uh, Draft Guide. Uh, he does such a phenomenal job and, of course, resident expert here on the Packaday podcast as well. Uh, Andrew Murtag, of course, also from Packaday and covers the draft uh, very seriously, puts together his own big board. Um, so looking forward to having Andrew on. And then Brennan Rupp, who does such a phenomenal job breaking down draft prospects over at Packers Wire. So we'll have three draft-centric guests in Jacob, Andrew, and Brennan stopping by throughout the course of the evening. And then, like I said, Maggie and myself, co-hosting. That will be Friday night. And then Saturday, at some point during the day, I'll be doing some members-only Q&A uh, at that uh, point as well. I don't know the exact plan for that quite yet, but as we get closer, we'll break that down. But three live shows, again, Thursday Q&A, just myself, Friday live show during the draft with Maggie and our draft experts, Jacob, Andrew, and Brennan. And then on Saturday, a live members only episode at some point as well. And of course, I'll be doing draft breakdowns and immediate reactions to every single draft pick uh, throughout the course of the weekend. Saturday, I might do like round by round, but there'll be content. Trust me, there will be content. And then on Thursday and Friday, I plan on doing uh, some sort of live pre-draft Q&A on both of those days during the day as well. So there is going to be a ton of draft content as there always is uh, every single day, but even more than usual for the draft next week. So if you're not subscribed yet, make sure to do so. And of course, check out the Packaday Podcast YouTube memberships as well. Not a ton of notes from Friday, at least as I'm recording this. I'm recording this a little bit earlier than I usually do, about 2.30 p.m. on a Friday. So maybe we get some breaking news later on Friday. But uh, Rob Domofsky went on with Wildy and Tausch and talked about the center position. And Tausch was talking about is Josh Meyer is going to be on the team. I'm assuming he meant in 2025. I don't think there's really any question of whether or not Josh Myers will be on the team in 2024. Uh, but Rob brought up an interesting conversation that he had with a Packers executive where they said that Zach Tom, they think he's going to be, or, you know, can be a very good right tackle. I think they said a Pro Bowl right tackle, an All Pro guard, and a Hall of Fame center. So that was Rob's uh, conversation with the Packers executive, which led Rob to believe that yes, the Packers center is probably on the roster, but it's not Josh Myers; it is Zach Tom. What that means for what the Packers will or could do in the draft at right tackle, that brings up an interesting situation and, and scenario that we need to discuss. However. I will leave you with a teaser. Tomorrow, we are going to be going over the offensive tackles in this draft, and that will perfectly segue into maybe some right tackles that Green Bay could be interested in at or around pick 25. I did quickly tweet out, like, I do think if I'm Green Bay, and even if you think Zach Tom is a little bit better of a center than he is a right tackle, he's been really freaking good at right tackle. I'd be hesitant to move him off of that spot just based on how well he has played, especially with how he's come into his own at that spot. He's settled in. He's comfortable. He's confident. The last thing you want to do sometimes is put them in a new spot just as they really get their feet under them and are starting to master a position. Um, the other thing too is I think you can find centers, whether it's a Graham Barton, whether it's a Jackson Powers Johnson, uh, whether it's a Zach Frazier, there are multiple really good centers that they can find in that round two range, especially if it's Jackson Powers Johnson or um, Frazier. Barton, if he's there at 25 or not, and if they take him, who knows, but there are centers that they can get. I would go that direction instead. Personally, I agree. And you guys know how I feel about Josh Myers. I would be willing to move on from Josh Myers as a starter, or maybe have him compete at right guard with Sean uh, Ryan. I'm okay with that as well, but I would go in a different direction, but I would be more apt to go with like a Jackson Powers Johnson at pick 41. Yes, I know he in a lot of mock drafts, he's in the first round. That's not expected to happen. He's expected to go round two. We'll see. You never know. 
But if they could get him in pick 41 and keep Zach Tom at right tackle, I like that more than taking Zach Tom, moving him into center, and then trying to find a new right tackle in the first or second round. I just like the center option better of drafting one and keeping Tom at right tackle. But we'll go over that a little bit more tomorrow and what tackles could be there if they do, in fact, want to move Zach Tom inside. But today is not a offensive line-centric episode. Today is a defensive line-centric episode. And let's go over sort of the state of the defensive line and where it's at right now. As of right now, you've got Kenny Clark, you've got Devontae Wyatt, you've got TJ Slayton, Carl Brooks, Colby Wooden, and then you've got a Jonathan Ford. You could kick LVN in sometimes in some obvious pass situations, but you've got a pretty well-rounded group of de- group of defensive linemen and players that are all very capable that can rotate in. You've got your legitimate starters. You've got some upside plays. You've got some developmental players. You got a little bit of everything. You've got TJ Slayton, Kenny Clark, and Jonathan Ford, more of that nose tackle type position. You've got Colby Wooden, Carl Brooks, Devontae Wyatt at that three technique. Again, LVN can kick inside a little bit. You can move Kenny Clark over to that three technique from time to time as well. So you have the variety, you have the depth, you have the starters, you have the backups, you have the rotational players, you have a little bit of everything. That being said, I do still feel like defensive line is a little bit of an under the radar sort of sneaky need for Green Bay. And that's not necessarily based on where they're at right now in 2024, but more looking ahead to 2025. We know very, very well that Green Bay is not focused entirely on just what they need in 2024. They're trying to take best player available and they're trying to fill future needs as well. And right now, Kenny Clark, TJ Slayton, both set to be unrestricted free agents in 2025. And you're going to have a very interesting fifth-year option conversation coming up next season with Devontae Wyatt as well. As of right now, I think you probably decline that, but this is going to be a huge season for Devontae Wyatt as to whether or not that fifth-year option gets picked up. But either way, there are some long-term questions about the defensive line, even if you still like Devontae Wyatt long-term, Carl Brooks, Colby Wooden. There's still some upside there, no question about it. But more competition, more depth, and more future talent at this position isn't the worst thing either. And I still think you're sort of lacking a more like super well-rounded, high-quality starter next to Kenny Clark that you can just trust in almost any scenario. There's always that opportunity there as well. So it's not like this huge need. It's not a something where you're looking at the depth chart and be like, oh my goodness, if this team does not get a defensive tackle, they're just screwed. I would even say like, in, there have been plenty of seasons where if Kenny Clark went down, you're just like, oh my goodness, they are screwed, screwed along the defensive line. I think they'd mostly make it okay for as long as it's not anything catastrophic. If it's like a four or five game stretch, they could survive. They could make it with Wyatt and Wooden and Slayton and um, again, LVN moving inside that whole group. They could make it for a handful of games without Kenny, which is not something again that they've been able to say. So it's not in dire straits. It's not a, again, high-end need, but I do think there is some some still uh, long-term need at that position. And the other thing I'll say too is you can never have enough disruptors along the interior of the defensive line. Just never have enough of them. You always want more. You always want talent along the, the trenches. And if they find somebody like that, then by all means, go out and get a player that can help you do exactly that. The one thing I will say here, we talked about the two players that are unrestricted free agents next offseason, Kenny Clark and TJ Slayton. They're more at that nose tackle position. All right. The three technique position is pretty well set right now and even going into next year. Right now at three technique, you've got Devontae Wyatt, Carl Brooks, Colby Wooden, and Kenny Clark can play that if you want to play Slayton at the nose on some of those plays. And again, LVN can probably kick in and play a little of that three technique as well. So you've got plenty of guys who can play at that spot, both now and going into next year. It's that nose tackle, we'll call it nose tackle type spot that is a little bit more of a concern. If you were to lose Clark and Slayton next year going into the offseason when they're unrestricted free agents, you have, I mean, Jonathan Ford would be the next guy up at that spot. And that's a huge leap and certainly a massive gap between Kenny Clark, TJ Slayton, and what Jonathan Ford brings to the table. So if you are looking at a defensive tackle in the draft, and if you are looking at this as a more long-term need, or at least a 2025 need, you probably want to look a little bit more towards the nose tackle side of things than maybe that three technique side of things where you do still have the depth and the up and coming talent at those specific positions. If you're looking at what type of player that you're 
sort of trying to fit in that Kenny Clark mold? Well, he's 6'3", 314 pounds. This is the super unique aspect of this draft class. You have a ton of undersized defensive tackles and three techniques in this draft. Just all of them. Every single one is like 280, 290, high 290s, maybe low like 300, 301. That's where they're all at. It's all undersized three techniques and and just undersized defensive tackles. That's what this entire crop of defensive linemen is. You have one massive nose tackle in Tavondre Sweat at 366 pounds. So it's like you've got all these guys that are 290 and then one guy who it's not like he's like 20 pounds more. He's 70 pounds more. Like that's where this defensive line class is at. If you're looking for somebody at that 6'3", 314 range, anyone near that, anyone even close to that, that's not 360 or not like, you know, low 300s, the closest, the closest is Fabian Lovett Sr., who is Dane Brugler's 17th best defensive lineman on the board, and he is 6'3", 316. That's the only player that is like in that range if you're looking for complete fit like that would fit that Kenny Clark mold which is crazy like that you have this massive gap again where everyone's 290, one guy's 366 and there's like nothing in the middle. It is crazy. So if you are looking for that Kenny Clark or TJ Slayton type player, unless you're going with the 366 pound Devondre Sweat or waiting until much later in the draft, that player just kind of doesn't exist. But let's go over the players that are there, what Green Bay could do, what they bring to the table and if any of them actually make sense for the Packers. The top three defensive tackles, there's a little bit of maybe non-consensus at that number three spot, but the number one is Byron Murphy. He's 18th on the consensus big board. Number two is Jerzon Newton or Johnny Newton, 27th on the consensus big board. And then number three, I think is probably going to end up being Chris Jenkins. He's 51st on the consensus big board. I think Dane Brugler is probably a little bit closer uh, to where he goes. He's 36th on Brugler's board. And I think that's probably, again, a little bit closer to where he goes. You also have Michael Hall from Ohio State, Braden Fiske from Florida State, Tavondre Sweat, as we talked about, from Texas, and then Mason Smith from LSU. Those are some other players in that day two, maybe early day three range as well. Uh, But I think your top three are probably, certainly Murphy and Newton, and then maybe Chris Jenkins somewhere in that number three spot. The Packers, as we know, picked number 25. So what are we looking at with defensive tackles in comparison to around where pick 25 is? Well, Byron Murphy is likely gone. He's expected to go in the top 16 of the draft, somewhere in that range. That's right now where sort of his, his floor is. At least that's what's expected. You never quite know. Things can change. Things can happen. But he's expected to be gone about nine to 10 picks before Green Bay selects. Johnny Newton, somewhere between pick 25 or maybe even a little bit sooner, 23 to 32. I would say 23 to 33. I think in that range for Johnny Newton. So well within Green Bay's range at pick 25. And then Chris Jenkins is probably early to mid round two. I don't think he gets in the first round conversation, but I think as as soon as that uh, day two starts, he's probably start, you know, starting to get in that conversation with teams that need a three technique slash defensive tackle. So that's the players that are around Green Bay. I love Michael Hall. We'll talk about him a little bit. I think he's probably more like a mid round two. Braden Fiske's really fun, but he's like a thousand years old. He's like high 24, but that I don't he, and again three technique overall if you're looking at somebody to take in the first round the player that makes most sense around that range is Johnny Newton but does he fit with the team do any of these guys fit with what Green Bay is looking for per usual let's go through it let's start with Chris Jenkins all of these of course are what you would consider premium position players along the defensive line Green Bay has valued these positions in the past he had a 8.99 relative athletic score, did not do the three cone, but did do everything else. Thank you, Chris Jenkins, for doing everything else. Uh, but yes, he passes the relative athletic score test over eight, comes from a power conference at the University of Michigan, and he's 22 years old. So he hits all those main thresholds that Green Bay usually looks for in the first round or those, I guess, indicators, if you will. The defensive line specific indicators, broad jump over 80%. Yes, he was at 95%. Over six foot two. Yes, he's six, two and a half. Over 295 pounds. Yes, he's 299 pounds and was 301 pounds at his pro day. So in a sneaky sort of way, Chris Jenkins hits everything for a first round prospect. Now, I don't think he grades as a first round prospect. I think he grades more as a early to mid to late round two sort of guy, but he does hit the things that Green Bay generally looks for. 
Now, Green Bay does also very much value agility. It's not something that has been an indicator necessarily at defensive tackle. He did not do the three cone and was only 39th percentile in the short shuttle. That could turn Green Bay off a little bit. And again, as we talked about, that three technique position, which is what Chris Jenkins is, is not exactly what Green Bay needs. So they're going to have to sort of weigh that out a little bit as well. From a PFF standpoint in 2020, had a total of three snaps with a 60.4 grade. 2021 had 175 snaps, had a uh, 72.4 grade that season. In 2022, 536 snaps with an 80.7 grade. And then in 2023, 418 snaps with an 82.7 grade. What you love to see here is that better year over year over year. 60.4, 72.4, 80.7, 82.7. He's continued to progress throughout the course of his career. Um, Overall, this past season, again, had that 82.7 grade with an 82.3 in run defense, 60.7 in tackling, and 70.5 grade in pass rush. In 2023, he had 228 pass rush attempts, 20 total pressures, which is a bit low for anyone that's considered in that top 50 sort of range. Only two sacks, 18 hurries, no quarterback hits, which is a pretty incredible number if you think about it. No batted balls, did have 26 stops and a 5.3% missed tackle percentage, which is great. And he did have an interception as well. So he came up with a big play. Some of the advantages to uh, a Chris Jenkins, team captain, you love seeing uh, the, the focus and the intensity that he brings to the table. And again, as a leader within that defense, very minimal wear and tear. You look at his overall amount of snaps, Three, 175, 536, 418. I mean, you're looking at a little over a thousand snaps in his entire four year career at Michigan. That is very, very minimal wear and tear. He's got quick, active hands and is a very quick first step as well. He shows the upside to be a solid run defender and has that ability to rush the passer as well. Even though that productivity wasn't super high, I do think he projects better in the NFL than he did at the college level. And I do think he's going to continue to improve just as we saw him get better year over year over year in college. He has those NFL bloodlines, of course, his his father, uh, Chris Jenkins, was a big time NFL player at defensive tackle. And then uh, he does a really nice job holding up against the run for his size. Again, he's not this 320 pound defensive tackle, but he holds up well, even against double teams, even though he's a little bit on the, the lighter side. It's not perfect. He needs a little bit more consistency there, but you will see him hold up against the run as needed. The negatives plays a bit too high, needs to play a little bit lower and play with a little bit better leverage. Struggles to hold up against double teams. That's where the consistency comes in. So he holds up against the run game, but against those double teams, that's where you can start seeing him get moved off of his spot a little bit more. So just a little bit more functional strength, a little bit more ability to anchor, and that should hopefully clean up that uh, to some extent, even if it's not its fullest extent, you're not going to get probably a 330 pound guy out of Chris Jenkins ever, but um, you want him to continue to develop that functional strength. I uh, didn't play a ton of snaps, so there's a lack of experience and it's probably going to take him some time to sort of make that transition into any sort of full-time player in the NFL. I do think there's more of a projection here for Chris Jenkins. There wasn't a ton of snaps. There's not a ton of experience. There wasn't a lot of productivity and he didn't make a ton of plays. Like we didn't see many sacks. We didn't see many, um, you know, pa- passes batted down or batted balls. Like you wanted to see a little bit more from Jenkins and you just didn't get it. And that's why he's considered a little bit more of a projection at that position. So there's still a lot to like about Chris Jenkins and he does hit a lot of what Green Bay looks for generally along the defensive line. I don't know that he adds anything new to the Packers defensive line experience. And I think that's a big thing here. He doesn't really, you know, have that Kenny Clark, TJ Slayton ability to play the nose. I don't think he's better than Devontae Wyatt. I'm not sure that he comes in and is immediately better than Carl Brooks. And, you know, Colby, what didn't you have there? Still the backup as well. I don't know that this is a player that Green Bay needs in any real extent anytime in the near, in the near future or gives them any sort of uniqueness to what they already have along the defensive line. Um, like I said, he does fit the, the thresholds of what Green Bay looks for. Probably more of like that late second round option where if he's available late in the second round or somehow even early third, Green Bay maybe takes a little bit more of a look at him there, but I don't think he's an option in round one. And I don't think he's probably even an option in pick 41 in round two, unless Green Bay just loves him. But the fact that he's a little bit redundant to what they have is more of that three technique. I just don't think they're going to feel like they need to spend a premium selection on a player when they already have those type of players on the roster. Uh, Overall, I would say he'd be an extremely underwhelming first round pick. He would add some depth, some versatility, some competition along the defensive line. Just think there's 
Like I would rather have Michael Hall later in the draft easily than Chris Jenkins anywhere near those first two picks that Green Bay owns. So it's not terrible. It's not bad. He's got a lot of upside. I'd be excited about you know, Chris Jenkins being a Packer. I just think you have to look at the value. And again, probably later round two, early round three is where that value gets a lot better for Chris Jenkins, specifically with what Green Bay already has on the roster. All right, next, let's talk about Johnny Newton. Again, premium position, yes. Relative athletic score, he did not test. He's had a foot issue, so he hasn't done any of the offseason stuff. So no relative athletic score. He is from a Power 5 conference coming from Illinois, and he's 21 years old, so he hits the age threshold as well. Broad jump is unknown. We know they love that broad jump for defensive tackles, but we don't know it for Newton. They love 6'2 players. He's six one and a half, so he doesn't hit that technically. And then they like 295 pounds uh, or heavier, and he is at 304. So not a ton here to necessarily go off of because he didn't do all of the offseason testing, but doesn't hit the RAS, doesn't hit the broad jump, and isn't quite 6'2". And once again, he's a three technique. He would fill in in that Devontae Wyatt, Carl Brooks, Colby Wooden, LVN sort of role, and they don't necessarily need that right now. From a PFF standpoint, in 2020, 329 snaps, 58.6 grade. 2021, 611 snaps, 57.7 grade. And then things took off in 2022, 723 snaps with a 91.5 grade. And this past year, 749 snaps with an 84.9 grade. In 2023, he had 43 total pressures on 402 pass rush snaps, eight sacks, seven hits, 28 hurries, two batted balls, 32 stops, but did have a missed tackle percentage of 20%. So a very high missed tackle percentage for Johnny Newton. Some of the pros with Newton holds up very well against the run, especially for his size being a little bit, he's not undersized from a weight standpoint, but he's just a little bit smaller. That definitely helps with leverage. But you look at him and you're like, oh, that guy's probably going to get his butt kicked in run defense. He doesn't. He holds up very well. He's slippery with an incredibly uh, impressive arm over maneuver. Gets pressure from a variety of different angles. You can line him up at different spots and he's going to find ways to get to the quarterback. His hands are consistently fast, consistently active, and consistently strong. You see very good hand usage out of him all throughout the course of the game against every single opponent, regardless of who he's going against. He plays on balance. A team captain, again, very similarly to Chris Jenkins. He blocked four kicks just this past year alone. So that brings some interesting special teams value to the table. Did not miss a single game in four seasons has 103 total pressures in the past two seasons combined, and he can win quickly. When he wins, he wins quickly, and that adds a ton of value. There's nothing more valuable on the defensive side of the ball than a disruptor who can get there with immediacy. So if you have somebody that can win quick and get to the quarterback or get to the running back and disrupt everything in the backfield, that is a huge win for the defense, and he does that pretty consistently, uh, at least he did at the University of Illinois. The downsides, he's a little bit tight to turn and he lacks a little bit of that closing burst to the quarterback, which is why there's so many pressures and not a ton of sacks for Newton. He has very small arms, which limit some of his finishing potential. Um, you will also, he's going to struggle against longer offensive linemen. They're just going to have the advantage of being able to get their arms on Newton and he's just going to struggle uh, to kind of counter that because he just has those shorter arms. Uh, he did have the partial Jones fracture that kept him out of the entire offseason activities. He should be fine. And again, he's never missed a, a game. So there's not a ton of concern there, but did have that injury. And then as mentioned, I would like to see him convert some of those pressures into sacks and have a little bit more of that impact. From a fit standpoint, you love disruptors. He is a disruptor. You love players who can play sound run defense. He can play sound run defense. Can never have enough of those guys. Would have a, a lot of value as a depth piece for Green Bay and somebody who can come in and rotate in right away. But I'll say it one more time. He's a bit redundant to what they already have on the roster being a three technique and not really having any nose tackle value at all. And that brings us to Byron Murphy. Premium position, yes, 9.23 relative athletic score. So, And he, guess what? Byron Murphy did everything. He did all the testing. So we actually know it's a real legitimate relative athletic score, 9.23. Uh, so he did all the testing. So checks that box. Comes from Texas, so Power 5 Conference and is 21 years old. So still very much within that age range. 80% broad jump, yes, he's at 85%. 295 pounds plus, he was at 297 at the Combine 306 at his pro day. So yes, the only thing he doesn't hit is they like their defensive lineman over 6'2". He's just a hair over six feet tall. So he's got about an inch and a half that he needs to grow, which is not going to happen, obviously, but uh, in order to necessarily hit their thresholds. But he hits everything else. I don't think that's probably a deal breaker for selecting him. It might be a deal breaker when you consider potentially moving up for him, which is what they'd likely have to do if they wanted to acquire his services and make him a Green Bay Packer. 
Um, like I said, hits everything except height. You would probably like him a little bit bigger and just heavier in general. I don't know that his frame is going to be able to add a ton more moving forward. But other than that, like I said, he hits everything that Green Bay likes. PFF, 2021, 298 snaps, uh, 73.3 grade. 2022, 392 snaps with an 82.7 grade. And in 2023, 438 snaps with a 91.1 grade. Again, you see year over year better, 73.3, 82.7, 91.1. You also see... Very minimal snaps, which is good for wear and tear, but not great for experience. And um, he just as he transitions to the NFL and you want him to play eight, 900 snaps, well, he's basically played that in three seasons. You know, 438 was the max he ever played in a season, and that was this past year in 2023. Um, he had 45 pressures and 273 pass rush snaps this past season, six sacks, three hits, 36 hurries. Did have an 18.5% missed tackle percentage, so a little high there, and 21 stops in the run game. 80.5 run defense grade, 53.9 tackling grade, and a 91.5, 91.5 pass rush grade. All right, his strengths holds up really well at the point of attack for his size. He's not Kenny Clark. Kenny's stronger. He's more balanced. He is more of a technician. But if you're talking about, something, like Clark's what, 315, like I said? He's maybe he's 299, maybe he's 301, you know, talking about, uh, you know, Byron Thomas here or Byron Murphy here, excuse me. Um, you know, he's not quite in that Kenny Clark range, but the fact that he can hold up as well as he can at that size is impressive. Maybe he can play a little nose on occasion. It's not ideal. Maybe he can put on a little bit more weight. I don't know if you want to take away from his burst and his acceleration, but I just in general did really appreciate how he held up at the point of attack. Does hold his ground against double teams. Again, can be more consistent, but you did see it on tape. Saw a lot of double teams at Texas. They were worried about him. Even with Tavondre Sweat next door to him, they were still very much worried about Byron Murphy. Wins with leverage, wins with quickness, um, and wins with a very quick first step, just very much like uh, Johnny Newton, but I think it's actually even a much better first step than what Newton's or Chris Jenkins is, to be honest. Changes direction very well. Looks the part and immediately jumps off the tape when you're watching him. And he was number one along the defensive line in college football, or at least, you know, the division one or whatever we're calling it now uh, for pass rush win rates among defensive linemen or interior defensive linemen. So he won a lot, just not a ton, right? Meaning he didn't play a ton of snaps. So his, his efficiency was amazing, but he didn't have a ton of pressures simply because he didn't have a ton of opportunity to do so. It's still 45 pressures is really, really good, especially on 273 snaps. Uh, but Again, you just like to see him play more snaps and even get more of those pressures. Weaknesses, uh, you really want to see him turn some of those pressures into sacks. Only eight career sacks, which is a very low number for somebody you're looking at taking in the top 15 of the draft potentially. Does have smaller arms and is very short, which again is going to limit him. 438 snaps, as we talked about, is the most that he's played in any season, and that was this past year. Lacks overall playmaking, eight sacks in three years, no forced fumbles, no passes knocked down, no interceptions. And some of the short arms and just overall size can lead to that. It's harder to reach out and maybe bat uh, a ball down or uh, reach up and bat a ball down or reach out and knock a ball out for a forced fumble or get around the corner and, and you know swipe at the ball from the quarterback. It's just a little bit limiting when you don't have that great size. And I think we see that show up with a lack of the playmaking from Murphy uh, throughout his college career. And then, as I mentioned, it's going to take some time to work up to a, a full-time player when he's only had, you know, between 900 and 1,000 snaps, you know, in his entire, a little over 1,000 snaps in his entire career uh, at in college. So there's going to be some ramp-up time there as he gets more accustomed to playing that many snaps in the NFL. I do think he fits very well. I do think he can do some of the Kenny Clark stuff, but probably not quite as well. And he's probably just a three technique. That's where he would fit best as a disruptive forceful three technique that also holds up very well against the run. The other thing here is, again, he's most likely gone by pick 17 right now uh, per Vegas. The over under on where Byron Murphy is selected is 16 and a half. And the favorite is the under at negative 160. So Vegas is very much thinking he's going to go before pick 16. The final verdict here, the final question we have to ask is, would Green Bay value him that much to go up and get him at his size and what his ideal position is? I think the answer there is probably no. As we talked about yesterday when we were talking about moving up for corners, if they want to get into that spot where they could take them, theoretically, pick 25 plus both of their third round picks should get them to around pick 15 if he's there. 
Pick 25 plus pick 58, their second, second rounder, gets them to pick 15 if he's there, uh, theoretically again. And then pick 25 plus pick 41, their earlier second, gets them somewhere around pick 10 or 11. So they could theoretically again have the opportunity to maybe move up and get them. But I don't see Byron Murphy being the target in that situation because of some of those size concerns and just not necessarily fitting with what they need both now and in the future at that position. Some other prospects to keep an eye on. Green Bay did have Michael Hall Jr. from Ohio State and Mason Smith from LSU in for top 30 visits. Hall is a 6'2 and a half, 299 pound defensive tackle, turns 21 in June. I love him. I love him. I love him. I see some Justin Matabuike coming out of college to his game. I think he has the ability to be a big time player and a big time disruptor. He's another one of those players that did not have a lot of the production, but had a lot of disruption. I'll put it that way. Not production, but a lot of disruption. Mason Smith is interesting. Defensive lineman, LSU, 65306. Finally, you get somebody that's a little bit bigger. He's not still quite in that 315 range around Kenny Clark, but 65306 is a big guy. Now, he had an ACL injury in 2022 that kept him out almost the entire season. I did not think he looked great bouncing back in 2023. Maybe he just needs that one more year, which we see from ACLs from time to time. I didn't think his tape was impressive in 2023, but this is a classic example of one of those players where they just don't make a lot of 6'5", 306 dudes that can play defensive linemen in the NFL at a high level. I'm not saying he can play it at a high level, but when you can find a fairly agile 6'5", 306 guy that's a top 100 pick, you have to always consider him because, again, you just always struggle to find those type of players at the NFL level. Braden Fiske is a really fun three technique who works his butt off, but he's overaged over 24 years old. Tavondre Sweat, as we talked about, 366 pounds. I don't think Green Bay would go in that direction. I don't think he's their exact cup of tea. He'd be a fun fit, uh, but that'd be probably more of a day three type of selection. Very funny. Maurice Jones Drew had uh, Tavondre Sweat mocked to the Packers in round one, which would be a major reach at that point. My overarching take here is I think they're unlikely to move up for Byron Murphy. I think they're unlikely to spend a first round pick on Johnny Newton. I think it's possible, but unlikely that they would trade down or, you know, even trade up in the second round to get Jenkins. I think he's more likely in that second round as a possible player. And then you're probably looking more at like day two selections of more like a Michael Hall or a Mason Smith, who again, they both brought in for top 30 visits. I think your most likely outcome here is that Green Bay mostly stays status quo along the defensive line and maybe takes one of those day three defensive tackles. If you're looking for one, they did have Christian Boyd in for a top 30 visit as well. Northern Iowa, 6'2", 329, so more in that Kenny Clark sort of range. 24 years old, but only a 3.00 relative athletic score with brutal agility testing. He's 19th on Dane Brugler's defensive line board and projected as a sixth round pick. That could be a visit that... They think maybe he goes undrafted, and if he's there after the draft, they're hoping to sell him a little bit on the franchise, but that could be a name to keep an eye on either late day three or maybe an undrafted free agency. I think most of all, the Packers can feel fairly confident right now and comfortable that they've got Clark, Slayton, Brooks, Wyatt, Wooden, Ford, maybe LVN a little bit, and they can work their way through whatever they need to work their way through with any injuries or things like that this season. They're still in a pretty good spot. I think you can probably go through this draft without having to attack it with any real top 100 pick, maybe get a depth piece in day three to come in and compete and just see what happens there. But I think they can feel okay with the starters they have now. And if Clark and Slayton or one or both or whomever ends up leaving in free agency, I think you can sort of reevaluate next off season if they want to do something where they bring their own free agents in, maybe bring try to bring those guys back or just go attack it more aggressively in the draft next year in 2025. All right, friends, that's going to do it for me today. Thank you so much for joining me. Let me know if you think any of these defensive linemen make sense. My ultimate gut tells me day one, no. Day two, maybe Hall, um, you know, maybe Jenkins, maybe Mason Smith. But I think this is more of like a day three type draft uh, at the defensive line for the, the Packers. But let me know what you think. Shout out to our Hall of Fame and all pro members, most hated Minnesotan, PJ Wynn, John Wild, Shea Bradad, Brandon Paletta, Jennifer Wright, Boom Handle, Donald Lee, Lori Lord, Baby QB, David McCluskey, Donald Decker, Bremen, David Prendergast, and Dan Miller. I will see you guys soon, but until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.